Tango Tech is one of the many certified mad scientists of the Minecraft universe. He's responsible for some truly revolutionary iron farms in the past, and he's always been known for his unique and grand approach to redstone. And nothing exemplifies this quite like his mini-games. From the Tangler, to Ruse, to Among Us in Minecraft, Tango has no shortage of creativity and genius when it comes to minigames. Most recently, he's turned that creativity and perhaps madness up to 11 with Decked Out and Decked Out 2, which he's currently building on the Hermitcraft server. If you don't know what that is, don't worry. I'll be giving you an abridged explanation of it in these videos, but please do check out Tango's videos to hear it from the man himself. I mean, after all, He's the one who designed the dang thing and is building it in survival. Insane. So, without further ado, welcome to the very first episode of Nguring the show where we dissect another Redstoner's design to see what makes it tick. That's engineering backwards, by the way. Get it? Reverse engineering? Anyways, uh, let's get into it, shall we? So today we'll be looking into the card shuffler. Basically, every session of Decked Out 2 starts with the player dropping a shulker box full of cards into the system. This is their deck. Some cards are permanent effects that last throughout the game, and some are temporary effects that are slowly played as the game progresses. The goal is to separate the permanent cards from the temporary cards, and then play the temporary cards in a random order. So, let's see what Tango did to make that happen. The first section is right here. This is the shulker unloader. The player's shulker box full of cards will fall through that hole up there into the hopper. The shulker will get unloaded. Now the cards will start moving along and the first section they go into is the permanent card processing area. You can only have each permanent card in your deck once. So when the, the first time it's played, the system will turn on and subsequent times nothing will happen. You won't get any more signal. All right, so here's a smaller version that I've built right here. So let's go ahead and dive in. So the strategy that he's going with is that all of the cards, no matter whether they are permanent or temporary, are gonna be making it down this hopper line over here, except the permanent cards are going to be filtered out early into this system. So let's see exactly how it does that. So right off the bat, it's pretty easy to see that this right here is just an array of item sorters. Now, if you're unfamiliar with item sorters, I did just make a what the heck video on that. So you can catch that on the top right, right up there. So I think it's pretty easy to see that in his design, all of the permanent card effects are going to be filtered out through here. So here, I, I don't know what cards he's gonna be using, probably like custom items, uh, but I just decided to fill these up with various redstone stuff over here. So you can see that when a permanent effect card makes its way down this line and gets filtered into one of these, you can see it drops into this hopper and then it is picked up by the comparator. The signal extends down to here and it does its regular filtering thing over on this side here. But you can see also this piece of redstone powers this block, which powers this dropper, which drops a single item into this hopper here, which is permanently being locked by this line right here. In fact, the whole line is being locked right here. So as Tango mentioned, he wanted to make sure that even though there might be multiple of the same cards making it through the system, that this thing only activates once. So that's exactly what this thing is doing here. So no matter how many times this piece of redstone lights up, and no matter how many times this dropper is activated, this comparator over here will only turn on the first time that that happens, and the rest of the time it'll just keep clicking. So in essence, this is kind of like a modified RS Norlatch, where instead of another dropper facing into this dropper here, it is a hopper that is being locked, and then I presume that it gets unlocked whenever the system needs to be reset. So you can see the full flow of the system here. Uh, if a card comes through and it is not one of these, permanent effects, then it just cruises on by and ends up over there. But if it is filtered by one of these, then it goes ahead and gets filtered down into its specific dropper. Now, I assume these will be kind of spammed in order to bring it back to the user. I, I do believe that's the way that it is supposed to work, although I'm not 100% sure, but it makes its way down into there. And at the same time, it activates its corresponding dropper over here which if it hasn't already been activated, then pushes its item into this locked hopper. This hopper, because it's locked, it holds onto that item, and then it gets read by this comparator, and then you see a constant output. 
So if we make our way over to this chest right here, you can see that it's got some redstone components, white concrete here, but only these three, the oak button, the comparator, and the torch are actually being filtered out by this. So we should see the piston, the observer, and the concrete end up over in this hopper, and we should see the appropriate lamps light up for the rest of these three. So let's go ahead and see if that happens. So let's just go ahead and wait and see. There we go, two of them lit up, then a third, of, uh, third one lit up, and then let's see if we go over here. Yep, you can see the sticky piston, observer, and white concrete. And then over here, these three lit up. So this one would be the torch, the button, and so this one would be the redstone. Oh, hold on. Uh, here. Nope. Wait, did I have... Uh, hold on a second. Nope, it actually just was a comparator. My memory is just bad. So there we go. All three of them were filtered correctly. Let's go ahead and check these droppers as well. So we should see, yep, one in each of these. Oh, right there. And let's say for instance, if we toss in another one of these comparators into the system, yep, you can see it gets sorted out again, uh, but this time it just went ahead and clicked this dropper, but it didn't change this output at all because, well, this hopper already has an item into it. And then if we see over on this side, yep, it, the second comparator made its way into the correct dropper. And then I assume at some point during the game or on some kind of clock, uh, this line over here probably gets spammed and uh, all the items make their way back into the shulker boxes or something like that. We'll, we'll see in time. And then of course the reset of this RS Norlatch, simply just turn off this line and then lock it again. And there you go, all of the lights turned off at once. All right, Tango, let's see what's next. So any card that makes it through the permanent processing area right here is now a normal card that needs to be shuffled, put into the player's deck, and, you know, distributed throughout the course of the game. And the way this works is actually pretty simple. Basically, any cards that come in here will flow into these droppers here. We have eight droppers. You can see the arrows here. They're just making a basic loop here. All the droppers are just rotating the cards randomly in a huge circle here. So they get randomized quite well. Uh, and then when they're done, the hoppers below here will all unlock and all the cards will flow into the chest uh, and eventually into this uh, dropper down there. And that's where the cards are ready to be distributed on a clock and be processed in the cards processing area. Okay, so I built the next part over here. And uh, yeah, this is really, really cool. I'm very much into it. So let's, uh, let's go ahead and explain what's happening here. So any card that's not a permanent effect card is going to be making it down this line here and into this dropper here. And it's going to go into this loop of droppers that is all being activated at the same time. So this is really clever right here. Essentially what Tango's managed to do here is sort of mimic the way that you would shuffle real life cards by hand. You would just kind of like take the whole deck and then just kind of like shuffle random ones around, right? And that's exactly what this thing does because if you weren't aware, droppers actually just pick a random slot, basically if more than one slot, oh, hold on a second. So when a dropper has more than one of its slots full like this, then when it gets activated, it actually chooses at random which of these to fire out. So 50-50 chance over here. But if all nine were filled, then you have a one in nine chance for all of them. So you can see that they get pretty random. And when all eight of them are doing that, it does get actually very, very random. So basically a pulse is fed into this redstone dust right here, which will be just some signal strength. Let's say it's 15. So a 15 signal strength will make its way into here, get passed all along down this line, get passed into here, get passed all along down this line, and then output here. Now, since it was a pulse, right, this redstone signal is now a zero, basically. And so uh, when this 15 gets here, then it passes on a 14 signal strength to here. And then as you can see, 10 ticks later, the signal strength of 14 makes its way to here and then it decays down again. So 14 to 13, down and down. So this will be a lot easier to show you if I go ahead and just place a redstone. Oh, hold on a second. So you can see here that this redstone block is imparting a signal strength of 15 here that is being passed along here, over to here, and back to here. And so we have 15 on all of these sides here. And now if I go ahead and remove it, you can see that it drops to 14, 
13, 12, 11, and all the way down to zero. Now you can see that it is actually counting down rather slowly. That turns out to be 10 redstone ticks because there are five comparators on this side, five comparators on this side for a total of 10 redstone ticks. So 10 times 15 would be 150 redstone ticks. Long story short, this is a really nice and compact way to get a really long pulse out of a short pulse like this. You can see it lasts for a very long time. So in the context of the card shuffler, basically what this thing does is as long as this is on, this is shuffling cards. So basically it just controls exactly how long the cards will be shuffled. And the way that this thing turns on, it looks like it is being triggered from this hopper over here. So the first card that isn't a permanent card that comes through here, will go ahead and turn this on and then turn this pulse extender on as well. So you can see that this redstone makes its way over to here, but it also gets passed down into here, uh, into this repeater here, and then down all the way around into all of these target blocks. So from below, you can see that all of these target blocks are right next to hoppers. And what this is doing is essentially while this pulse extender is on and therefore all of these are shuffling, obviously we don't want to be pulling the cards out of these droppers as they're shuffling, right? We want to make sure that we keep these hoppers locked until after we're done shuffling and then pull them out of the droppers and then put them into this chest right here. So to basically simulate what happens, let's go ahead and push this button. So you can see that the uh, shuffler goes crazy. It's very, very loud, but you can see the signal strength decaying over here. And then sooner or later, it will turn off and then pull this piston back. These will stop spamming. This will turn off and then all the hoppers are unlocked. Oh, and also this nifty thing over here, if you've never seen this before, you just basically push two observers into each other. They sort of observe each other in a loop right there, and that's a way to get a really fast clock. So that's exactly what this is using in order to do the shuffling randomly. Now, I will say as clever as this is, I do see a flaw with it, because if a single item comes through here, then this is only on for, uh, well, I'm not sure exactly how many ticks, but it's certainly not 10 ticks. And so actually what ends up happening, I think, is that this pulse extender here doesn't actually turn on and stay on. It actually will cycle. It'll eventually decay out, but it will cycle. Let's go ahead and see if I'm right about that. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and drop a piston into here. It should make its way all the way through. And then you, yep, there you go. You can see that it is just cycling and then yeah, no, that's a big mess because also, okay, hold on. Uh, okay, so it finally stopped. Yeah, so basically this is just kind of like pulsing and also this line right here is turning on and off, which means it is prematurely taking the stuff out of these uh, droppers over here, which isn't very good. So I assume with this that Tango is probably anticipating more of a stream of items because then that would work. So if you go ahead, I just put a whole bunch of different varieties of wood into here. So there you go, they're in the same order as in the creative inventory here. So we can actually see whether or not the shuffler is working. So let's go ahead and unlock that and you should probably see them come through. And there we go. You can see that all of these are now full of items because you can't hear them anymore. Uh, this is decaying back down. We can take a look at this chest right here. Yep, it's empty still. And there we go. And we should see our items come back. And yeah, you can see that for sure they are in a different order than here in the creative inventory. So yeah, this shuffler definitely works. Super cool stuff. I will say though, if there are multiple of the same card in the deck, then even though this thing is doing a good job with shuffling, they will group up as they stack in this chest. Um, not sure what he's gonna do about that one. On to the next thing.
I have set up a 48 slots, 48 card processors for normal cards. And each card handler, of course, is just a standard sorter to start with, but it's a little bit, a uh, little bit extra, kind of like we did with permanence over here, where it was only the first card to be processed. Right here, we want to be able to process three cards of each type. Okay, so I've gone ahead and built it right here. He did a pretty good job of explaining it, so I'm just going to kind of breeze through the explanation here. So right here you can see an ordinary item sorter just like we have over here, but you can see that there's a lot more past the item sorter than it was over on the blue circuit over there. So as a temporary card comes through the system over here, it gets filtered out, it gets detected by this comparator, the signal strength then gets forwarded into this torch and this torch will blink. And because this is a temporary effect, that's why we have this thing blink instead of having a constant on signal like over here, but it still does have this modified RS NOR latch. So let's see exactly what this is doing. So up here, each one of these droppers is outfitted with three items here. And you can see that each time an item comes by and gets filtered, this torch will blink off and then back on, which will kick an item from this dropper into this hopper. And this hopper, of course, will keep it because it's being locked. And if we come down here and place a lever here, we're just gonna simulate this item filter working. So we're gonna go ahead and flick it once and you can see that a torch has been kicked into this hopper here. Flick it another time, now there's two. Flick it a third time and you can see now that this dropper is empty and this comparator has picked up on it through this block here and pulled up this block via this piston. So you can see now that if this item gets filtered a fourth time, then nothing will actually happen. It won't be passed onto this torch and so the effect can only be played a maximum of three times. And you can see here that this is true for any one of these slices. But it's still nice because it still gets filtered through. You can see that this item sorter here is not affected at all. So the item still gets sorted and put into its dropper. And now let's find out what happens to the cards after they're played. So take it away, Tango. As cards are processed, they're going to follow this top ice track here, and they're obviously going to get picked up by the sorters that are in the back there. But once they do, it'll loop around, and the card will be spit out the droppers in the front here, and then this right here is essentially the discard line, where it'll go down to that mess over there, and most likely be put back into their shulker box to be processed. But you'll notice like about these little barrels here, that's how I'm going to handle ethereal cards. I just I just simply swapped out the, uh, the dropper with a barrel, so if it's an ethereal card, it means it can only be played once and it's automatically destroyed it just goes in the barrel but in addition to ethereal cards which of course destroy themselves immediately as soon as they're played there's also the rule that i'm going with where every card that's played has a five percent chance of being destroyed after play and that's what this does down here there's a five percent chance down here with a series of droppers it's a one in five chance followed by a one in four chance and then you know it'll it basically will fall into one of these hoppers here and go into the uh destroy chest or if not it'll fall in right there's where the shelter will be loaded Okay, so I've recreated that the best I could. Uh, there was a lot of it that was hidden, so I had to use kind of my intuition to fill in the blanks, but I think this is basically what he's got going on. So as the temporary cards get spat out here and go through the system, they will make their way into these droppers here, or if they are to be not returned uh, to the player via this line, then they will end up here in this barrel. And then he has this line sort of down here with observers and that's responsible for triggering all of these droppers at once. And then the used cards make their way down this water stream all the way across here and into one of these two hoppers. Now if it ends up here then it is set to be destroyed uh, or go into this chest over here and then if it goes into this hopper then it will be returned to the player. So let's see how he made that happen. So as Tango mentioned, every card will have a 5% chance of being destroyed and therefore also a 95% chance of ending up over here and being returned to the player. So he explained the way that he did this. Uh, we basically have two randomizers here, uh, one that is running at a one in five chance or 20% and then this one on one in four chance, uh, which is 25%. And if you multiply those two together, then you'll get 5%. So I'm guessing that this line that's coming in here is coming from some sort of global clock. Uh, I'm not sure where exactly it's coming from because there's not much that he shows with the clock system. Actually, I skipped that system. So, I mean, if you wanna go and uh, look at that on his video, you're more than welcome to, but 
I couldn't really glean enough information off of it to recreate it, so uh, we're stuck with this one here. But anyways, pulses come in from the clock like this, and you can see that each time that this goes, there is a 5% chance that this will retract. So let's see exactly what's going on here. So the way that he set up the one in five randomizer is through a dropper right here. So we have a wooden shovel representing success, and then we have four different stackable items that are representing fail. Now, as we saw before with the shuffler, oh, now as we saw in that shuffler over there, when a dropper has items in many different slots over here, it actually chooses randomly which slot to use whenever it's activated. So let's say for instance, this lightweight pressure plate gets moved over to this hopper here. Okay, it looks like we got a target block instead, but it's still the same thing. It's a non-stackable item. So that gets spat into this hopper over here. It gets read by this comparator with a signal strength of one. Now, because it's a signal strength of one, it doesn't quite reach this randomizer. So it actually doesn't trigger at all. And you can see that I put this redstone block over here. That's just to hold the item in this hopper. But normally, if we can see it over here, you'll see that this comparator pulses. And so basically, if it pulses with a signal strength of one, which it normally does, uh, four out of five times, it won't trigger this next randomizer. But if it pulses with a signal strength of two, which let's see if we can get it to happen. Let's see. Nope, there we go. Uh, we got it to happen just a little bit there. Uh, this one, this next one should have fired. And you can see if I look into this one, this is one in four, so we have one in five here, and we have one in four here, and that's being read by this comparator, and exactly the same setup here. If it spits out a signal strength of one, it doesn't get passed onto this repeater, but if it gets a signal strength of two, then it does get passed onto this repeater and triggers this dispenser or this dropper right here. So you can see here that by chaining two randomizers together so that the output of one activates the next one, it's mathematically equivalent to multiplying the two probabilities together. And that's why these two combine to make 5%. So now that we understand why this is 5%, let's see exactly what it does. So there's a 5% chance that this dropper over here gets activated. And you can see that this dropper has an item in it. And you might actually recognize this right here, a dropper facing into a dropper as an RS Norlatch. So anyways, the torch over here gets spat into this dropper over here, which is being read by this comparator, goes into this block, into this torch, and then this piston retracts. And when this piston retracts, two things happen. First, it unlocks this hopper, and it also lights up this line over here to lock this repeater. So let's go ahead and simulate that. I'm gonna go ahead and put a button over here. And there you go. You can see that the torch has moved over here and it is being read by this comparator. This redstone block moved over here, unlocking this hopper and then also locking this repeater. So let's see exactly why that's the case. Now, the reason that this repeater is being locked is because by doing so, you basically block further rolls on this 5% machine. So let's see exactly how this gets reset. Now looking over top of this, you can see that this hopper right here is being read by this comparator, and that signal is snaking all the way down to the reset dropper over here. So you can see that if an item comes through, I'm just gonna go ahead and throw this button into the water stream. There you go, the item drops in, and then this hopper is relocked. Uh, you can see that the stone button made it into here and this line gets unlocked and now you can continue rolling like that. And you can see that when it's in this state, you can just throw an item in and it'll actually cruise past this hopper and then into this hopper. But then if we go ahead and simulate a 5% success right over here, you can see that it waits for an item to drop in and get picked up by this hopper and this resets again. Now, a quick note about quasi-connectivity here. You may have noticed that this redstone block being diagonal to this dropper may cause some issues, but it's actually not the case. 
And this is because the reset line that actually resets this RS NOR latch is being read from this hopper, and this hopper will only accept items when this redstone block has moved over there, so it's no longer QC powering this. So this setup, as suspicious as it might look, is actually perfectly fine. And you know what? I'd say that's pretty good for a skeleton mock-up of Decked Out 2's card managing system. Now, I do want to mention that the video that we're referencing here is 9 months old, so there's a lot that might have changed in the system between then and now. But that doesn't mean that there's not a lot here that we can still learn from. So I hope this video was educational, and I hope you enjoyed this new format that I'm trying out. Definitely let me know if Nerigne is a series that you'd like to see me continue in the future, and please drop some suggestions in the comments for other cool contraptions that you'd like to see me dissect. But yeah, that's it for now. See ya. So, without further ado, welcome to the very first episode of Nerigne. <laughs>